No. There's your cue. That is my cue. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes with our favorite poem project forum. This is Philip Moore speaking to you live from the Star King Room at UUFNN. <laughs> Philip, you could have an excellent career in public radio and broadcast. You know, it's so funny you mentioned that because I um, once did a phone recording for a go live at work and somebody said, wow, you sound a lot like a weatherman. <laughs> it's a good thing. Interesting thing is not knowing. I had my other readers on. Okay. Hmm. So, um Daniel, we're going to get started, but I do have um, some folks that I am expecting um, uh, to read, and Patty and Brad are at the top of the list, so uh, I'll just go back and monitor them, but uh, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and get started with our chalice lighting, and I don't have a reading today. What I wanted to share, uh, since we're going to be doing so many readings, uh, what I wanted to share is that um, this uh, forum is really about not only sharing, but holding space for each other. Uh, poetry represents different things to us, um, and I'll speak to what it holds for me, uh, but I ask you all to hold that space and to listen with your heart, listen with your mind as to what this means for you as a person, what this means for the person who's sharing. And um, so that will be our intention as we light our chalice. And hopefully if I speak towards the chalice, this owl camera will pick me up at the time. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's doing that. So a couple of uh, logistical things in the room, just to be aware, you are all on camera based on when you speak. And so if you don't want to be on camera, don't say anything. Don't make noise. Um, um, and don't cough or sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, and what I am going to do is ask um, folks who are here, who will be reading poems, to come and sit in this chair. And the reason I do that is just to make sure that the camera and microphone pick you up at the best sound quality possible. Um, and um, I don't know if they're ready, but Patty and Brad, you were first on my list to read since you first asked. So are one of you ready to come up and read your first poem? Will you go first and then I'll turn up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my name is Brad. Uh, thanks for doing this and organizing it. This is a great way uh, to do poetry, I think, sharing poems. Uh, usually, I've been involved in paper poem projects uh, across the years. I usually read Walt Whitman because he is my favorite poet and my favorite poems, most influential. But uh, last time I read his poem, I mentioned that George. Orwell said some valid criticism about Walt Whitman is he's one of those poets that tell you how you should feel instead of actually making you feel it. So um, one way that I think you can actually feel it is through ancient Greek tragic poetry. For example, uh, you might hear love your enemy, but you actually through the ancient Greek poet Sophocles, I actually feel like it. I'll just read you a short passage here. And uh, an example uh, picks up the drama. Athena, do you see, Odysseus, how great God's power is? Who was more full of foresight than this man or abler, do you think, to act with judgment? Odysseus replies, None that I know of, 
Yet I pity his wretchedness, though he is my enemy, for the terrible yoke of blindness that is on him. I think of him, yet also of myself. For I see the true state of all us that live. We are dim shapes, no more, and weightless shadow. Uh, ancient Greeks had a different relationship to the divine, of course. Uh, it doesn't translate, always translate well into our culture. But uh, this tragic disposition, and uh, I think is an important outlook. And I will share another favorite poem that uh, Robert F. Kennedy shared while on the campaign trail. He was making his rounds. He went into Portland, Oregon and kissed some babies there, including my wife, uh, Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we have the, uh, well, I'll just read from what I wrote. An example of, from our nation's tragic history suggests the vital use that poetry can provide. While campaigning in 1968, Robert F. Kennedy, upon learning of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., found himself in the awful position to have to break the news to a congregation of predominantly African Americans. Mm -hmm. And after breaking the news, Kennedy, who drawn on the poetry of the ancient Greek poet and dramatist Esclus, Following his own brother's assassination in 1963, the President John F. Kennedy shared as follows. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Escalus. He once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. That's what I'm sharing. And uh, to cheer you up on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <he's next>. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this little beauty is by Sandra Cisneros, um, who is I think best known as a writer, she wrote um, House on Mango Street. And uh, this is called Black Lace Bra Kind of Woman. <laughs> and yes, I'm wearing a black lace bra. Watch your leg. She's a black lace bra kind of woman. The kind who serves up suicide with every kamikaze poured in a neon blue of evening. A tease and a twirl. I've seen that two-step girl in action. I gambled bad odds and sat shotgun when she rambled her 59 Pontiac down blurred lines, dividing sense from senselessness. Ruin your clothes, she will. Get you home way after hours. Drive her 59, 75, I'm 35, like there is no tomorrow. Woman zydokoin, I'm sorry, woman zydokoin her way into the decade. 30 years pleaded behind her like the wail of a San Antonio accordion. And now the good times are coming, girl. I tell you, the good times are coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna share next. Um, <clears throat> so poetry, as I've discovered it over the years and starting with this fellowship and um, a poet we had as a member for a long time, um, has represented for me um, capturing a feeling or an emotion in a way that is so poignant. And, and this ex particular example reminds me that this particular feeling that I was having the other day <laughs> is not a new feeling um, and not something that I've come up with and probably not the end of the world that I'm having it. Um, so it was 2 a.m. Uh, a week or two ago and um, I should take a step back and say, I've taken a break from my professional job to see how I can work in sustainability in Northern Nevada. Wish me luck. And what comes with that 
is a sense of needing to really accelerate things. And I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea how I'm going to get a job. Okay, Grace, honestly, I don't. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, it's important work. But at 2 a.m. in the morning, it really feels like either there is no solution, or I don't know what it is, or I don't know what I'm doing. And it wasn't a helpful thought. But here it is. And I think you all might recognize it. It's from Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5, after Macbeth heard about the death of his wife. And he says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all of our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And I'll close and say it is easy for me to reside in that place. It's very easy, but it is something that is a touchstone for me to avoid. Thank you. Okay, so my next, do I happen to have uh, Eric Novak or Ann Keniston on the line today? Nope, neither of those folks. Okay, I thought they might attend, and since Anne's a professional poet, I asked her to be here, but, uh, mm -hmm. so Kevin, I believe you are up. Well, Brad, thank you for quoting my favorite East Coast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it leaves me uh, <clears throat> regretful that uh, I didn't bring the poem on East Coast that I've been working on for several months because I could have had a, a critical review to, to <laughs> help me get <laughs> and, 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 so, uh, and in fact, the, the uh, the, the poem actually quotes the awful grace of God uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the famous uh, Robert F. Kennedy quote that you referred to. And, and I'm also impressed that in the audience, we have someone who was kissed by Robert F. Kennedy. And instead, I chose something uh, a, little, a little bit uh, easier, and that is uh, the song of the wandering uh, Angus. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Philip referred obliquely to um, Jay Udall's all too short stay with us mm -hmm. in our congregation. Um, and he uh, uh, actually wrote a, a poem referring to um, uh, the, uh, the, the fire in the head. Uh, it was the title poem of a uh, collection of poet, poems that he wrote that won the XJ Kennedy Award. Um, so you might wonder, what is a wandering Angus? So, so let me tell you a little bit about that because it's kind of fun. Uh, Angus was uh, sort of a uh, love god in... Um, uh, Irish uh, uh, mythology, actually Irish and Scottish uh, mythology. So there's several versions of the story, but he's sort of the icon of uh, the, uh, the the lover who whose uh, whose love is gone, and he searches the world uh, for her. Um, he's 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 kind of a combination of. Heracles and Cupid, if you want to analogize um, uh, Roman mythology. And uh, uh, one of the versions uh, is uh, cited in a, uh, uh, a tale called The Wooing of Aton, uh, which is found in the, the Yellow Book of Lycan. Lycan's in that, that arm of the Republic of Ireland that, that uh, snakes up the West uh, coast uh, or the west border of uh, Northern Ireland. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Aitan was a beautiful woman and the uh, the daughter of a king. And somehow Angus had offended his brother 
And so his brother required him to uh, uh, win the hand of uh, Aten for him. Uh, well, the king required, uh, I can't remember what it was, 12 labors, but uh, Herculean like labors that he completed. And so he was able to take Aten home to his brother. The problem was that eight, uh, uh, his brother was married and um, uh, uh, his wife uh, in a uh, fury of jealousy turned a tongue into a fly who was blown out to sea and took seven years to get back. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, of course, poor Angus is looking for her all of this time. And uh, it's not recorded whether he recognized the fly when it finally appeared. Uh, but it was supposed to be a beautiful fly, so maybe. Uh, in any case, the fly followed him around for quite a while until he figured things out and was able to reverse the spell, but only partly, so that she was in a human form at night and he could spend the night with her, but a fly by day. So this is not a fly by night tale. You <laughs> so uh, Angus is also uh, portrayed in Scottish uh, or Irish uh, mythology as uh, one who leads lovers through the forest, uh, playing his golden harp uh, with its silver strings. So the gold and the silver um, will. will Come to the fore in the poem, I think. Um, the um, uh, another version uh, reminds us of uh, Northern European mythology, Russian, uh, Swedish, German, um, uh, that underlies uh, Swan Lake. Uh, in that version, um, uh, Angus is searching for a woman he has seen in his dream uh, and he searches the world for her comes to the lake of the dragon's mouth where there are 150 swans who are uh, chained by the lake uh, and he's told that his dream girl is one of them and if he can recognize her uh, in the swan in her swan form then uh, he will be united with her, right? So he changes himself into a swan and finds her, and they fly off together, right? Uh, and you might remember in Swan Lake, there was also uh, the theme that uh, the, the prince um, could be with uh, Odette at night in her human form, but during the day she was a swan. So it's a, there are similarities in these, in these myths. Well, anyway. So that's, that's just to give you an idea of who Angus is. And this is the song of the wandering Angus by W. B. Yates. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the glimmering air. Though I am old with wandering, through hollow lands and hilly lands. I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon and the golden apples of the sun. And so, some of you, um, uh, <clears throat> um, baby boomers, may remember that <laughs> Judy Collins sang this entire poem on her album, The Golden Apples of the Sun. Wow, uh, now I'm gonna have to go look that up, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, if you liked uh, I'm Made of Constant Sorrow, you'll like uh, uh, The Golden Apples of the Sun, so. Uh, 
The uh, I do have a second poem, if that's permitted. Please, yes. Now, I'm a little embarrassed by, by this poem because it's it's just a little above doggerel. Um, <laughs> it, it displays an excess of alliteration, uh, and it's a political poem. And political poems, by their very nature, are generally bad poetry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but nevertheless, I thought it would fall gently on the ears this morning. Mm. Okay. So this is entitled, To a Distant Relative. Your postings ply the web. <laughs> scattered across the landscape. Soil of spikes, loam of lies, ground of gall, croft of cruelty, bilious bastions of bitterness, morose meadows of malice, foul <laughs> fields of fear and fury. From each savage seed, a willing warrior rises, armed with rancor and spite and stench of death, dragon teeth. I, I should have introduced the poem by uh, explaining dragon teeth, uh, which is um, comes from the um, and Brad will appreciate this uh, with his classical education. But uh, uh, it's the legend of, of Cadmus, who was the founder of Thebes, and uh, uh, he slayed the dragon, scattered the teeth across the soil, and from each tooth arose a warrior. And of course, they immediately began fighting himself. So. But seven of them he took to um, conquer the tribe uh, uh, where Thebes was, was uh, uh, founded. So Can you confirm who the author is of that poem? poem? We haven't mentioned who the author is. Oh, oh, I thought I explained that. that I, I had just written this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, Gaia, I, I believe I saw you earlier and you had said you wanted to read a poem. Are you prepared to read one for us? Yes, although I've added another one that it's, so it's only nine words. So I hope I can, and it was because you were talking about um, being awake at two o'clock in the morning. So this is from Musical Tables. It says, three, uh, there were three poems in the New Yorker by Billy Collins, whoever that might be. The poem is called 3 a.m. 3 a.m., only my hand is asleep, but it's a start. <laughs> so I really like that. <laughs> and then um, I'm uh, actually, uh, Kevin, you, you read one of my very favorite poems by Yates last, and last year, I would think I read that briefly. Maybe I didn't, maybe I just had read it to myself, but, um, I'm, I'm going to read a, a Yates poem. It's from a 1928, um, collection of his poetry called The Tower. And I don't know if he meant, if Yates, I'm sure he, because he was into the occult, I'm sure he knew about tarot cards. And the, the tower in the tarot cards is like house cleaning or changing. Everything's going to change. And um, a lot of what Yates is dealing with in at this time of his life, and I don't know how old he is. I'm sorry. I don't remember when he, Kevin can maybe tell us quickly when he was born. Oh, dear. Uh... Well, his writing really began in the 1880s. Uh, right. And um, uh, of course, he received the Nobel Prize in, uh, I think, the 1930s. Okay. Well, this is 1928. And certainly, <laughs> when Yates considered himself to be an old man, whether he we consider him old at this oh. point or not. <clears throat> but he, in, in this collection, he's dealing a lot with coming to grips with it. And I know one of the things that he did, there was something about a, a thought back then that like um, something from monkey testicles could increase your virility. So he was trying things like that. So, uh, 
anyhow, the, the poem is called Sailing to Byzantium. And um, I've got my, my thing, <laughs> like, uh, you know, 19 or so when I had this book and was writing notes in it. So the book, let me, the poem, let me give you a little bit about it. It's in four parts. And I have written down that part one is a rejection of passion. And also the idea is the whole throughout this is that young people really don't understand the spirit and old people are cut off from sensuality. Whether we agree with it or not, that was his premise. So the uh, part one is a rejection of passion. Part two is an acceptance of the intellect. Part three, uh, a rejection of the mortal corruptible embodiment. And part four, the acceptance of the incorruptible. And just so that you have a little understanding of some of the images as they're being read, um, when he talks in part three about the sages standing in God's holy fire as in a gold mosaic on a wall, you can envision um, a medieval or even much older, much older, we're talking about Byzantium, um, mosaic uh, with, with like saints, and you can see that in your head maybe. Um, and the, the last one, I love the, the uh, this gold enameled bird on a bow singing because I can think of in, at the, in the Hermitage in, in uh, St. Petersburg, there are these wonderful things that would be created for the czar to enjoy. And one of them is a dome and inside the dome is a clock and, in, and also a branch with this bird on it that sings the times um, to, the, to the emperor. So that's a little bit of the imagery. And you'll recognize the first line, sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. Part two. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Part three. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, Turn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Part four. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bow to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing <laughs> or to come. Thank you, Gaia. <clears throat> so I do, I believe, Bob, you were getting ready to read something to us. Sure. I do have another person in the room who's going to read to us. Um, I don't have a list of additional folks at this point, so I want to open it up. Bob was a convenient person to open it up with, but I do want to invite folks on Zoom. If you also had to share, just raise your hand and I'll ask Daniel 
uh, to help me go through the folks on Zoom who want to read. And I know that if we don't have more folks, Kevin is more than willing to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but Bob, come on up. Okay. Uh, good to be here. And uh, um, I'm here because, it, it, first of all, uh, just being in this august body of, of people who share their ideas, I, I want, I, I'm thrilled that uh, some of you have considered uh, theater uh, poetry. And indeed, it is. Uh, not long ago, I went to a seven hour play. Uh, uh, broken two parts, I might add. But the lyricism of, of, of the play kept rapt attention, the subject matter as well, and of course the production itself. Uh, I'm not uh, interested in much as much in poetry as I am in the theater arts, but poetry and theater arts seem to meld and come together. The poem I can bring you my poet, uh, my poetry, goes back to my mother on Mother's Day. And I don't know why I remember this, but I remember it. I'm glad I have a mother, as glad as glad can be. I'm glad I have a mother who watches over me. My heart is the letter that tells how I love you. Because you are my mother, so kind, so good, so true. The poet I'd like to share comes from another spiritual community. Her name is Carolyn Pearson. I knew her when I was going to school and uh, in Utah, and uh, she married uh, a man that uh, I kind of introduced her to uh, because it was a tumultuous engagement. When they finally got married, the embossed uh, the embossed invitation came, and at the top of it was the word hurrah, meaning they finally <laughs> got to that point. Their, um, their coupling had a tragic end because he left the marriage and three children to pursue his own identity, which was that of a gay man. And it was in the 80s, and he uh, contracted AIDS. His wife, the poet that I will share a little bit about, took him in and actually nursed him to his death. Uh, out of that came a book called P.S. I Love You, which was made into a film. And that was probably the first, uh, first moniker of uh, the AIDS crisis, but how it affected family and uh, companions. She has become, um, she spearheads in her own way, the, the idea of uh, a mother God. She also writes very short poems, which are uh, significant in their own right. Carolyn Pearson is her name. And this is from her journal. Uh, Will I ever forget this day? They're very, very short. And so I'll, I'll share them with you. This is Mother Earth uh, call, and she shall be called woman is the title. Introduction, Eve, mother of all, a prayer to thee, all else to God, but this to thee, for thou art woman. Mother, tell me what to do, all other prayers to God, but this to thee, for thou hast been a woman for so long. Help me, Eve, mother of all. This is called exorcism. If I could place a teacup over each cricket that calls from the tall grass, if I could blow out the stars one by one, then peel the moon from the sky, if I could cast the scented breeze into a great well on the other side of the mountain, perhaps then I could walk into the night with the, without you still beside me. 
And this is called lament, and I think you'll get a chuckle out of this. To security search, there is no answer. Mosquitoes get slapped, and the Pope gets cancer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Daniel, did anybody raise their hands on Zoom to share a form? Yes, we have two readers that are available. We have Jeannie Kersey and Terry DeBarger so far. Okay, I'll welcome uh, Terry since he was on um, early. So Terry, please share. Well, how pleasant it is to to hear uh, all, both the poems and the the stories surrounding them and the the things people have to say. Thank you for for giving me an opportunity. Um, so I actually teach a poetry class to high school students, which is uh, an interesting sort of thing to have to do because um, nobody takes poetry voluntarily; they get put into it by their counselors. <laughs> um, and and so you. Um, all of the, the good things about poetry classes you have in college are sort of removed and you're left with all of the bad things about poetry classes perhaps sometimes. So um, I wanted to share uh, just two poems um, and they're both by poets I've had interactions with about their poems. Um, one because I lost her poem and I couldn't find it so I reached out to her and she's a, a poet um, it, uh, Stony Brook, her name's Haley Lifehower. And I just really like this poem. And it was the first poem that got me as a teacher interested in things about poetry that I could teach kids or I could show kids that go beyond just meaning or what the poem is about. So she wrote a poem called Lust Song. And it goes something like this. Love's a blonde gone wrong on a fog-bound ship, slow off-shoulder slip of a strap unstrung. It's the glib, dip-thonged, soft Freudian trip of disloyal lips, sight of bright red thong. It's dictatorship of a yielding tongue, still culling the throng, the blinding eclipse of faint fingertip, felt light, not long. So I quite enjoy that one for the wordplay and the sound play. Uh, involved in that one. I think it's it's a gr great example of just the music musicality of poetry. Um, and she was kind enough to send me a copy of the poem and of course tell me I could use it in class, which was really nice. And then the other one's a popular poem with my students and the poet has published two versions of it. And I asked her about why she changed one of the lines and she seemed to think that the second version she poet she published was better and she had some reasons for it. Um, and I actually mm -hmm. prefer the first version she published. And this is a poem that my students generally like and, and love to imitate. And it's by Julie Sheehan and it's called Hate Poem. I hate you, truly, I do. Everything about me hates everything about you. The flick of my wrist <laughs> hates you. The way I hold my pencil hates you. The sound made by my tiniest bones were they trapped in the jaws of a moray eel hates you. Each corpuscle singing in its capillary hates you. Look out for I hate you. The little blue green speck of sockland I am trying to dig from under my third toenail left foot hates you. The history of this keychain hates you. My sigh in the background as you pick out the cashews hates you. The goldfish of my genius hates you. My aorta hates you. Also, my ancestors. A closed window is both a closed window and an obvious symbol of how I hate you. My <laughs> voice, curt as a hair shirt, hate. My hesitation when you invite me for a drive, hate. My pleasant good morning, hate. You know when I'm sleepy, I nuzzle my head under your arm, hate. The whites of my target eyes articulate hate. My wit practices it. My breasts relaxing in their holster from morning to night hate you. Layers of hate, a parfait. Hours after our latest row, brandishing the sharp glee of hate, I dissect you cell by cell so that I may hate each one individually and at leisure. <laughs> My lungs, duplicitous twins, expand with the utter validity of my hate, which can never have enough of you, breathlessly like two idealists in a broken submarine. 
<laughs> Thank you, Terry. <laughs> and uh, we can go to the other person. Was it Loretta that Daniel mentioned? Jenny. 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 Okay. Jenny, go ahead and share. Okay. What I have is a book of poetry, of poets, poems that were written by Joe Crowley. If anybody remembers Joe from UNR, he was president for 23 years longer than anybody else. But Joe was also quite the character. And <clears throat> later, uh, when he was president in the last years of the presidency, he started taking poetry classes from Gail Palmeyer in the English department. And her comment on the back of his book says, hats off to the cap is a book full of music, silent detail and deep compassion. Savor, savor. Uh, this one here, Joseph was funnier than the devil. But anyway, this poem is called East Meets West for Breakfast. Last week, I, I, excuse me, <coughs> Dajian, I nearly kicked the family toaster when its failure to perform summoned memories of countless bad encounters with many such machines. One of them daily took delight in sending out singed contents. Second gave perfection on one side of the bread, combustion on the other. A third <laughs> mortar leaving leavened shells in all directions. Then the current animated dot, excuse me, animated model gadgetry galore and a release gear afflicted with appliance style erectile dysfunction, never really, never ready when the moment arrived, holding on instead to whatever came its way, an English muffin say, or a piece of pumpernickel. This is the model I moved from the counter to floor and whose computerized insides were the cause of my ill temper and target of my focused, fast moving foot. It's homicidal journey ending at the edge of destruction when I noticed next to the toaster's former home in a small tray, an idle chopstick. I picked it up, put it right to work, winked out two captive slices, slaughtered on some loganberry jam, chewed myself into a cheerful mood. This ancient utensil now occupies a place of kitchen consequence, having redressed countless breakfast grievances, done more for the cause of toast than generations of retrogressive predecessors and introduced to the toaster world, the promise and power of chopstick technology. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. This Thank book you. is called Hats Off to the Cap. And it was done in 2016, not too long before he died. So if you're looking for some fun poems, you can get that one at, at um, Sundance. Thank you. Jeff, you want to join us? <laughs> I guess that you were doing your doing the um, eight word poem. I remembered one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christian upbringing, though the seeds never germinated, <laughs> but the poem stuck for some reason. That one. Sakai is he climbed a tree, the Lord to see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that one stuck. Um, and we were talking about um, lies. I had to learn one in high school. We had to recite one in front of a class, in my um, English class in junior year. And it's Robert Frost. Um, and a lot of times he's kind of seen, some of his poems are seen as kind of dour, or you, you see him as the national poet you know, in his elderly times and whatever. But he had a lot of playful poems too, but he usually tried to work some meaning behind them. Um, this one's called Departmental. So, an ant on a tablecloth ran into a dormant maw. Of many times its size, he seemed not the least surprised because his business wasn't with such. He gave it scarcely a touch and was off on his duty run. Yet, if he encountered one of the Hyde's inquiry squad, whose work it is to find out God and the nature of time and space, he put him to the case. Ants are a curious race. One crossing with hurried tread, the body of one of its dead isn't given a moment's arrest. He seems not even impressed. But he no doubt reports to any with whom he crosses antennae. And they no doubt report to the higher up at court 
Then word goes forth in Formic. Death has come to Jerry McCormick, our selfless forager Jerry. Will the special Janizary, whose office it, whose office it is to bury the dead of the commissary, come take him home to his people? Lay him in state on a steeple, wrap him for a shroud in a petal, embalm him in ichor of metal. This is the word of our queen. And presently on the scene it appears a solemn mortician, and taking formal position, he seizes the dead by the middle, lifts them high in the air, and carries them out of there. No one stands around to stare. It's not anyone else's affair. It couldn't be called ungentle, but how thoroughly departmental. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jack. Thank you. Um, one more request. Do we have anybody else online who on Zoom who wants to share? No one has currently identified themselves as being ready to share at this moment. Okay. Share if uh, you have time and you wanted something. Uh, go ahead. We'd love to see you on, on okay. camera if we could. Oh, I don't know. I haven't taken my shower yet, but here goes. <laughs> Let's see. Where are we here? Um, I've opened the poem, but now I haven't uh, closed the uh, the video. Open the video. Okay, here we go. Let's see. I haven't read this in a while, so I don't know how well it's going to go. It's called Maniac in the Garden, and I found it when I was a garden club member many years ago. Earthworms crawled out of the hole I had left when I pulled out the dry-looking twig, brown except for the two green leaves, and what looked like dead kernels of nuts I consigned to the bucket where I left the trowel and shears. Pleased, I looked around. The garden at last looked tidy. Ah, the weeds all gone, leaving a circle of golden flowers that formed a fairy ring. Proudly, I pounded, pointed to my handiwork when he came home. Looks lovely, he said with a smile. Only to learn from a neighbor next day, and much to my dismay, I had pulled out our, or his, beloved Granny Smith sapling the tulip bulbs awaiting the coming of spring, and the yellow flowers I was in love with were actually weeds called dandelions. It's by Rena Rooks of Tasmania, uh, Australia. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? Okay, Kevin, I'm gonna ask you to close this out with whichever poem you think oh. would close this out well. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Uh, well, for a completely different um, uh, shift in focus here, uh, uh, Jane Kenyon is one of my favorite uh, poets. Uh, she was married to another poet named Donald Hall. Uh, uh, he was actually, I think, her professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, and there was a fairly large uh, age disparity. Uh, in any case, they both were award-winning, uh, multiply published uh, poets. And uh, in uh, 1994, she developed leukemia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that experience, the 15 months that she spent fighting leukemia became the subject of uh, poems by both of them. Uh, but there are two that she wrote that I find especially uh, meaningful as she, wisely and thoughtfully anticipates her own uh, her own death. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, first one is called Let Evening Come, which is also the title of one of her books of poetry. <clears throat> Let the light of late afternoon shine through chinks in the barn, moving up the bales as the sun moves down. Let the cricket take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass. Let the stars appear and the moon disclose her silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den. Let the wind die down. Let the shed go black inside. 
let evening come. To the bottle in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to air in the lung, let evening come. Let it come as it will, and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless, so let evening come. And the, uh, the other one is called Other Ones. So you can, you can imagine from the title what she means by other ones. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning, I did the work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day, just like this day. But one day I know it will be otherwise. <laughs> there, there does seem to be a little competition here for the shortest poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I, 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 I'm going to win this. Okay. <laughs> this is by Kevin Young, uh, a, a Black poet at um, who teaches at Emory University. Uh, uh, who wrote the ironic collection of poem called Ode to the Confederate Dead. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, this isn't in that book, but um, <clears throat> uh, it's, um, it's entitled Elegy. The cemetery bench, still warm. <laughs> five, five, five words. <laughs> Kevin, stay there, stay there. Oh. Okay, so thank you all for sharing. Thank you all so much uh, for sharing, for holding space for everyone as they shared uh, what is meaningful to them. And um, so thank you once again. We'll look forward to doing this again in the future. But uh, I would also like to note what we have coming up in forum in two weeks. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, I think Leah is on. The, she uh, is on. Uh, and uh, she is going to be presenting um, if I if I have this right, uh, she is a uh, lobbyist for a nonprofit, and uh, she's going to talk to us about getting ready for the uh, 2023 legislative session in the, uh, oh. in the spring. Oh, and uh, uh, some of you may know that the BDRs or Okay. Bill draft requests. Bill draft requests uh, are drafted in December, so it's very close, actually. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very good time to think about how we might approach mm. the uh, uh, the legislative session. And uh, Leah, would you like to elaborate or correct? I would a little bit. Thanks, Kevin. So just so everyone's aware, I am a um, an equity partner at Bells and Case Government Affairs. I do lobby for some nonprofits. We also have some for-profit clients, uh, but I am always happy to get more folks engaged at the legislature and we'll, we'll just be so excited to talk about what that looks like. Uh, my, my spouse is making fun of me in the door because I want everybody to vote. I want everybody to participate and your local elections, your local politics, that's the easiest place to do it. So I'm very excited to um, help folks start that process if you're interested and I will uh, be here next week. We will have some bills to review by then too. So woohoo. <laughs> so two weeks on November 20th. Two weeks. And be here in person or on Zoom. We'll see you then. But you only get donuts if you come in person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no home delivery. No no cash. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.